Ladies and gentlemen, how is the food? Very tasty? Yes. Yes. We'd like to thank Suya Joint for the food and Cesar, two really fine restaurants here in the city. You should take a, another look sometimes. Uh, sometime, check them out. Um, how about the, uh, the jollof rice? I was told to tell the Nigerians, ladies and gentlemen, this is Nigerian jollof rice, not Ghanaian. I have to apologize to the Ghanaians. But there is always going to be an Africa Day number two, right? So um, perhaps it'll be a Ghanaian next year, right? Uh, thank you very much for coming again. My name is Jason McSparren. I'm a recent PhD in the Global Governance and Human Security Program here at UMass Boston. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My co uh, MC here is Ja, and Ya is going to introduce our first speaker. Please continue to eat. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Ya Opuku Ajman. Don't forget, I'm going to be here for a while. So, <laughs> I, first, I just want to welcome everyone to the very first Africa Day here at UMass Boston. <laughs> We are so grateful for your attendance and cannot wait to share with you today's speakers, panelists, food, ideas, knowledge, cultural, and all things Africa. Mm. So now that we have satisfied your appetite, for now, you know, always hungry, growing college student, <laughs> but um, let us begin our event by first intro um, introducing Dr. Adozi. Dr. Adozi is a professor and associate dean at McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. Specifically, she is a professor of international relations within the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance. Dr. Adozi is also chair of the African Scholars Forum and author of Pan-Africa, Rising the Cultural, Political Economy of Afro-Capitalism in Ubuntu Business. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Adozi. Welcome, everyone. Did, did um, Jason ask you how the jollof rice was? <laughs> did he remind you that it was Nigerian jollof rice, not Ghanaian? Yeah? <laughs> All right. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I have about 10 minutes to um, just sort of welcome you officially and let you know what we're doing here at uh, UMass Boston uh, with this um, Africa Day today. Um, so I want to start off by saying hujambo, habari, uh, that's Swahili, and oi, Cape Verde, and my own Igbo language, kedu. Any Igbos in the house? Okay. Um, there, there is a real Africa Day, but it's not today. Uh, worldwide, Africa Day is celebrated on May 25th, every year since 1958. So at UMass Boston, we are a few months early. We couldn't wait that long. Besides, we, we wanted to celebrate Africa during Black History Month. Before February ends tomorrow, we wanted to remember important people and events in the history of the global African diaspora, as well as deliberate and reflect on important um, African critical issues. Once called African Liberation Day, Africa Day was founded at the first Congress of Independent African States held in Accra, Ghana on the 15th of April, 1958. That conference called for the founding of an African Freedom Day, a day to mark each year the onward progress of the liberation movement and to symbolize the determination of the people of Africa to free themselves from foreign domination and exploitation. Today, African Liberation Day has become an institution throughout the African world, from Roxbury, Boston, to Johannesburg, South Africa. It's a day when all people of African heritage and their friends come together. At UMass Boston, we'd like to use Africa Day to launch some important new initiatives around the study of Africa at the university. 
Of course, today is not the first time that Africa has been celebrated at UMass Boston. Our um, African Student Union and other African student groups, um, the Cabo Verde student group, the Ghanaian student group, um, they hold biannual African cultural gala nights. What's more, our Department of Africana Studies has provided a long-standing platform for African-American, African diaspora, and African study. The Africana Studies Department at UMass Boston is a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary field of inquiry, which is focused upon the social and cultural histories, politics, literatures, economics, environment, and psychology of African diaspora peoples in the Americas, Africa, and the Caribbean. Its broad educational goal is to document and disseminate a specialized body of knowledge about the Pan-African experience with a special emphasis on human equality uh, right here in American society. I'd like to recognize um, the new chair of that department. Uh, her name is Professor Kibibi uh, Max Shelton. Um, and um, is she here? Uh, she did say she would try to make it. Um, and also the dean of the College of uh, Liberal Arts, and his name is um, Dean David Turkler. UMass Boston also um, houses a center for African, Caribbean, and community development, and that is directed by Dr. Jemadari Kamara, um, who may also be with us today, or maybe he'll be here later. Um, I'd also like to talk about one of the center's um, important programs, um, and that is the YES program. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, UMass Boston's Vice Chancellor for Athletics, Recreation, Special Projects and Programs, and his name is Charlie Titus, who has been instrumental not only in the growth of UMass Boston's athletics, but also of collegiate um, athletics um, as a whole in New England, um, across the country, and especially in Africa. The YES program, which is, uh, stands for Youth Education and Sports um, with Africa, develops the athletic prowess of young people while expanding their educational and cultural horizons in West Africa. The program was modeled um, around the Niami Hoops a basketball camp begun in the 1997 um, in the Nigerian town of Niamey. Uh, the program gave um, youth aged seven to 19 the opportunity to acquire skills while learning about computers and other technology, health issues, and their own cultural heritage. The McCormick uh, Graduate School's uh, Global Governance and Human Security Doctoral Program also houses a range of interdisciplinary faculty research and doctoral training programs uh, that engage the continent of Africa. So given these and many more phenomenal, really phenomenal programs um, in Africa, about Africa, in May 2018, many of the Africanist faculty on campus convened the Africa Scholars Forum. We call ourselves the um, ASF. And so the forum is a university-wide, or has become a university-wide academic platform for the teaching, research, and programming of Africa. We aim to serve many functions at UMass Boston, including um, building a more formal educational presence um, around African studies, providing a collaborative hub uh, for the work of Af uh, African studies, um, facilitating shared resources and pooling existing initiatives in African studies in a convened, organized, institutional space at UMass Boston. There is one friend of Africa that I'd really like to recognize for inspiring the forum's emergence and for hosting its establishment and for sponsoring the forum's launching um, today. Um, in Africa Day. Uh, he is uh, the Dean of McCormick uh, Graduate School and his name is David Cash. I believe you see him sitting right next to me uh, in the picture, but he is here today. Please, uh, could you stand up? You will hear from him later. Um, but I'd like to say a few words about our Dean. 
He is a former uh, commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and an accomplished academic and practitioner in the fields of sustainability, environmental, and energy policy. At UMass Boston, uh, since he was appointed in 2015, uh, Dean Cash consistently shows a deep commitment to applied research and a fundamental desire to integrate rigorous world-class academic research with on-the-ground policy-making and decision-making that affects um, and makes a difference in people's lives. His commitment to Africa has inspired the formation um, of my work um, in uh, the Africa Scholars Forum, and the Africa Scholars Forum is hosted um, at the McCormick Graduate School today because of him. So I want to thank you, Dean Cash, again. Um, our Africa Scholars Forum members are listed uh, in a brochure on your tables. I, I just would like to recognize their attendance today, if I could, and um, their names. Um, and if you are here, I'm just going to quickly call you up because I think it's important. Um, uh, Maria Ivanova couldn't make it today. Um, Darren Q is here. Great. Um, Jane Papad is here. Um, Malcolm Russell Einhorn is here. Timothy Shaw is here. Thank you. Courtney Sprague. Um, Stacy Vanderveer is here. Um, and then with the school, and those were all McCormick Graduate School faculty. Um, with the School for Global and Social Inclusion and Social Development, we have Cindiso Mincy Weeks is here. Okay, with the College of Education and Human Development, we have Tyra Mendez. Um, and Angie Stone. With the College of Liberal Arts, we have Ping An Addo. Nada Mustafa Ali is here. Um, Chinello um, Achebe. Christopher Fung. Heidi Gagenbach. Um, Jimadari Kamara. Adunia Lemmy. Kibibi Mac Shelton. Aminar Pilgrim. Jean Rene. Anthony Van Der Meer. And with the College of Nursing and Health. Uh, sciences, we have the new Kari Ann Gakumo. Is she here? Um, okay, and then we have um, non academic units, uh, Charlie Titus. And I'd like to recognize our student assistants, um, Ellen Busolo is here, and um, Balkisa uh, Diallo, um, Olanike Olajabi, and Marianne uh, Kamunya. Um, and that is the Africa Scholars Forum, and just like to recognize that. So we have a lot to offer you today. And let's turn to uh, Africa Day today. And um, our first theme, our theme of the day is Pan-Africa Rising. You may have heard of the theme, um, the motto, Africa Rising. Africa Rising is a term coined by Goldman Sachs, actually, uh, to describe the rapid economic growth in, in Africa after year 2000. Uh, according to the Financial Times, Africa Rising is a narrative that argues that improved governance means that the African continent is almost predestined to enjoy a long period of mid to high single digit economic growth, rising incomes, and an emerging middle class. Um, it's also associated with the democratization of African states um, since the end of the Cold War, comparative peace, uh, greater availability of mobile phones and internet, and an increase in African consumer spending, as well as growth in entrepreneurship. However, Africa rising is criticized by many Africans as being one, um, an external narrative that merely superficially transforms a perception about Africa from a site of perpetual malice. After all, just um, 20 years ago, Africa made Time Magazine's headlines as um, the hope, hopeless continent. Um, so now it's become this perception um, that transforms, um, transforms Africa from perpetual malaise, um, conflict, and economic stagnation to one of untapped wealth and potentially limitless economic growth. So it's been criticized um, as a mythical construction of Africa that 
that reveals the continent's long-standing and unique place in the Western imagination as a career for some, a cause for others, and a source of confusion, frustration, disinterest, and ignorance for even the most reputable observers of foreign affairs. That is why Pan-Africa Rising reappropriates the Africa Rising trope. Acknowledging, on the one hand, the can-do, positive, political, economic transformations ongoing, absolutely, in Africa. But it also reintegrates the motto into the continent's pan-African roots and its democratic, self-determined, pan-African economic imaginaries. In a recent book that I published with the same name, I argued that Pan-Africa Rising reveals African political and economic models that are presenting more authentic and meaningful growth prospects for Africans. Pan-Africa Rising, however, underscores the significance of culturally driven responses by Africans to the global political economy that infuse African identities, their self-determined economic imaginaries and aspirations into global development discourses. So with this theme, we hope that you will join us in engaging a vibrant and resourceful discussion, deliberation, debate, and even reflection of contemporary African opportunities and challenges. We have created a mural um, to symbolize Pan-Africa rising. Where is Jack? And where is our mural? Um, Jack Whitaker, are you in the room? Okay, where's our mural? Mural is right there in front of me, so that's why I can't see it. So we, we've created, and uh, with the vision of Jack and um, Ellen, but the, the artwork of um, Jack Whitaker, um, our doctoral student, um, we've created this mural to illustrate and sort of embody um, the Pan-Africa rising um, sort of future, but we also welcome you all to leave your mark um, by leaving comments on the note cards um, surrounding the murals, is that correct? Okay, would like you to write down your own aspirations and visions for Africa. We are all Africans, right? Um, Gwyneth um, uh, said we are Africans. We are all Africans, and so would like you to write about your visions as well. So now to today's program. Um, uh, our first keynote um, uh, speaker is finally here. Yeah, there I see her, Dr. Pearl Robinson. I'm not inviting you up yet, so don't, don't worry, you have time. Um, but she will speak about an important um, uh, figure in, in, in world history, uh, but certainly in African history, and his name is uh, Ralph Bunch, um, the first African-American to gain a PhD in political science from an American university. Um, the first African-American to win a Nobel P Peace Prize for his work as a United Nations uh, mediator. And also, you know, he's a vanguard Africanist whose, um, was it Harvard or Howard dissertation? Uh, she'll talk about that. Um, it was Harvard or was it Howard? Harvard. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, he, uh, his, his dissertation, all the same, offered a comparative analysis at the time um, of French colonial administration of the West African nations of Benin and uh, Togo. Okay, um, and um, our gala night um, keynote speaker um, is, um, did he just walk in? Is, um, is Zadi Zuku here yet? Okay, um, he's not scheduled until this evening, but um, he is um, uh, from the Ivory Coast, and he's a filmmaker, independent filmmaker, um, and he's going to show uh, scenes from his latest, um, and highly acclaimed, by the way, documentary, Black and Black, uh, where he explores relations between African-Americans and African immigrants and the African diaspora. A fascinating uh, story. Um, we have two great panels of star-studded scholars from UMass Boston and from Greater Boston neighboring universities, including uh, Tufts 
University, Northeastern University, Brandeis University, um, Brown University, and the great, and I say the great, Boston University, because they have a phenomenal African studies program, if you don't know, at Boston University. They're the best in the region, and one of the best in the country. Right, Eric? Are you there? <laughs> the assistant director of the African uh, Studies Center at Boston University, Eric Schmidt. Okay, um, and so, um, okay, these are our great panelists, um, and you will meet them all um, a bit later. Um, just acknowledging them, making sure you all are here. Are you guys here? <laughs> all right. Okay, and um, those are our questions as well. Okay, let me um, talk about um, our students because um, this day um, showcases uh, the many students of Africa at UMass Boston that are not just participating in today's event, but you know, participate every day in Africa work um, at the university. And so um, we do not have a Pan-African University, um, but we do have a Pan-African Students Group, and um, they are organizers and co-sponsors. Um, just like to acknowledge their names, and I know I misspelled some names, Ellen, Misulu, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, but just acknowledging them, um, we also have um, the groups, um, the Ghanaian Student Union, the African Student Union, the Cape Verde Student Union, and um, the Somali Student Union. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge our moderators, uh, the newly minted PhD um, doctor now, just a few days ago, although I, I, I do tell him that he has successfully defended his dissertation, but he has not deposited it. So he cannot use um, the doctoral um, identity right, right now. Okay, but, um, and the Ya Opoku Ageman, who I told recently that her name is Queen Mother. She said it's Thursday's child. I said, but it's Queen Mother as well. Um, It'll be great to um, hear from them as MCs today. Um, and also we have these uh, TED style, you know, flash presenters who are doctoral students uh, working on African study dissertations. And later on in the day, they are going to, um, you know, present their work in just five minutes each, okay, in a TED style uh, presentation. So stay tuned. Um, like to acknowledge uh, the community in Africa. Um, through our African marketplace, we have tried to bring you um, uh, the African diaspora entrepreneurial community uh, in Boston. So you, you know, um, of course, the African Meeting House. I, I won't start that history um, right now, but um, Africa lives in Greater Boston and New England, right? You know. Um, um, African history is as much American history embodied, you know, in this uh, community. So we try to bring um, some of them out um, for you to um, take a look at. And I have uh, lost the rest of my uh, speech. <laughs> so except to say, um, I'd like to, because I know it's going to be a long day uh, for all of us, and I may not have time and not have all of you in the room when I, I thank you know, some really important people that have put uh, this event together, um, especially, she said she loves the name, uh, Rochelle uh, Straker, she loves the queen mother name, the warrior queen, uh, Yah, uh, it's not her name, but her name is Rochelle Straker, but she said she's gonna do um, the African ancestry and tell me exactly where <laughs> she's from. Uh, currently, she's from Jamaica. Is she in the room, Rochelle? Rochelle, thank you. Um, your vision, your hard work, your, your discipline, your um, coordination, thank you for um, making this event happen for us. Um, yes, absolutely, thank you. Oh, there she is, there she is. <laughs> yeah, I just think, she, you know, she's a rock star. She tells me that she's gonna be the next Ghanaian president. I mean, she said so, right, Jason? Jason and I were looking at her like, okay. <laughs> Um, ya Opoku Agieman, young undergrad student. Uh, she's a four plus one student. We have a four plus one program. It's a bridge uh, BA to master's program. So she's a, um, a bachelor's and master's student in international relations. Um, you know, really 
this student is going to go far. Okay, so thank you, Yah, and the Ghanaian Student Union, the Pan African Graduate Student Group, uh, organized by Jason, Dr. Jason McSparren. Let's give him um, a round of applause. Really, he also um, is going to go far as um, an African Studies scholar and a security scholar. Uh, Jack Whitaker, your um, vision. Um, man, I, I didn't know you had it in you, but all those hype videos that you saw me send out, um, he put them together in a second. Um, very, very uh, inspirational um, young doctoral student we have here. So Jack, thank you. Mary Ann, where are you? Yes, Mary Ann, where are, where's Mary Ann? Mary Ann um, is our program assistant, a phenomenal student from Kenya. Uh, thank you, Mary Ann. Balkisa, uh, my new um, RA. Thank you, uh, Balkisa. Ellen Milimo, uh, where is she? Okay, there you are. Um, Sadia, um, thank you, Sadia. And David Cash, thank you very much. And every, anyone who I forgot. But thank you. Let the program go on. So I'm going to call up. Um, Jason and Yah to continue the program. Let's start the day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dozy, for that great introduction. I hope everyone's enjoying the food. What I'd like to do now is bring up our first administrative speaker, the dean of our program, Dr. De uh, the dean, Dr. David Cash. He spent his career trying to understand the better and better harness knowledge to solve pressing policy changes. He's a well-accomplished uh, academic. He's earned a PhD in public policy from Harvard University, concentrating in environment and natural resources. He's also completed an MA in science and education from Lewis and Clark College and a BS in biology from Yale. His job history includes senior positions in the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Public Utilities, and Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. In these roles, he's helped develop and implement nation-leading science-based environmental, climate, clean energy, water, waste management regulatory programs, innovative renewable energy, and grid modernization projects. In the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the nation's first CO2 cap and trade program. Great, great, great. And uh, while working in government positions, Dean Cash also extended his efforts internationally participating in a U.S. State Department mission to India in, uh, on clean energy and climate via USAID collaborations with regulators and policymakers in Tanzania and Ghana. He has published numerous professional, peer-reviewed academic and lay articles in books and chapters. He is a recipient of awards and fellows from the U.S., the EPA, uh, Environment League of Massachusetts, Harvard University, the Institute uh, the Institute of the Study of World Politics, Howard Hughes Foundation, Earthwatch, and the Environmental Leadership Program. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please have a round of applause for Dr. David Cash? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jason. My goodness, you forgot to mention that in fifth grade I uh, won the treasurer election in my fifth grade class, but that would make my mother very proud. Um, what a fantastic day. This is just, um, uh, you know, the fruition of so much hard work over the last year plus, and I really appreciate, as you'll hear a number of times in this talk, uh, Associate Dean Adozi, your speech right now, and all the work that you've uh, done here, but hold your applause, uh, that'll come later. Um, this, what, what's brought together here as, uh, as uh, Associate Dean Adozi talked about is many, many strands of work that ha happens here at UMass Boston, but all over the region. And I came to understand the deep research and teaching ties that UMass Boston has in Africa shortly after I arrived here at, as Dean, about three and a half years ago, and I was invited to join an NSF Argert trip to Ethiopia, interdisciplinary, uh, multiple faculty from multiple colleges, um, attended, students from, uh, PhD students from multiple colleges uh, attended, and we spent a week and a half, two weeks doing research, setting up research, creating collaborations with universities, with NGOs, with government agencies, um, and it was just a phenomenal um, experience. And it opened up to me this world of collaboration that happens here at UMass Boston. And then Associate Dean Adozi joined our team. So over a year ago, uh, she approached me and highlighted 
continue to highlight the incredible work in and about Africa uh, that's done throughout this university through the lenses of international relations and human rights and anthropology and public health and economic development, gender studies in the Africana Studies Department as she, uh, as she mentioned, and even as you heard in our athletics department. And um, she, she noted uh, while this work was characterized by excellence throughout the university, it could be made, it could be made stronger if networked and tied together, if synergies could be found, and that our work could be better linked to other work about and with Africa outside of UMass Boston. And today you are witnessing that. It's interesting when she described in her story of the genesis of the African Scholars Forum in this event, I noticed that she used the passive voice and she said, a meeting was convened. It was far from passive, what happened. And it was convened because of her work. She came up with this idea of trying to make a sum that was much greater than all of the pieces that are here at UMass Boston. And uh, for all that tireless work, uh, Associate Dean Adozi, we are so grateful. So thank you, thank you very much. She also, of course, realized that intellectual rigor, scholarship, and collaboration is always best served with good food and dance. So I hope you've been enjoying this and you will come for the gala uh, later. And I, I also just want to thank all of the folks who she acknowledged as well. Yes, she was the kind of uh, brainstorming behind the convening, but faculty from all over the university, as, as you saw, participated in the growth of the Africa Scholars Forum, participated in the creation of today, brought their students along. Students was leader, were leaders as well. I want to thank Vice Chancellor Gail DiSabatino, who as the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, corralled students, assisted students, gave uh, students support to help support this. So thank you very much, Gail, for your work. Um, and I also want to thank uh, our special guests that we have here, particularly our keynote speaker, uh, 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 Professor Pearl Robinson. Thank you very much for making it here today, and we're looking forward to, to hearing from you. Um, and uh, so, with, I don't want to keep you too much more from her. I know we have one more administrative speaker. I like the way Jason put that. I think that meant boring speakers uh, before the keynote comes. So, uh, I think we have Cheryl Nixon, uh, who I believe Yah is going to introduce uh, now. And maybe we will hear about uh, your election to your fifth grade. <laughs> Hello, it's me again. So um, our next opening remark is going to be from Associate Provost Cheryl Nixon. But first, I'm just gonna tell you my connection to her because she's really important in the sense that she made me very comfortable when she was my English professor back in my freshman year. Um, I'm not too very fond of Boston at the time um, when I was a freshman, but through her class exploring Boston under the College of Liberal Arts, she um, took our class on different areas in um, Boston and how they related to English literature and really opened my eyes to what Boston really had to offer and basically led up to my current success now. So. Let's get to the details. Um, Associate Provost Cheryl Nixon earned her bachelor's from Tufts University and master's and PhD from Harvard University. She joined UMass Boston as an assistant professor of English in 2002 and became an associate professor in 2007. And, oh sorry, and a full professor in 2018 and also served as the chair for the Department of English since 2012. Previously, she taught at Babson College and New Mexico State University. But today, Cheryl Nixon has been engaged in a number of global program initiatives at UMass Boston and is the Associate Provost and became and joined the Office of Global Programs in 2017. Now let's focus on the global programs. She leads UMass Boston's processes of strategically integrating the dimensions of international, transnational, transcultural, intercultural, and national trends and policies into the curriculum, teaching, research, community, engagement, and service functions of the university. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Cheryl Nixon.
Of course, I'm going to say thank you to Ya, and I can just say, of, of course, it was wonderful having her as one of my students. So um, the pleasure was all mine. I should be saying thank you to you, Ya. So I want to start off with just saying that I'm going to keep my remarks brief and that I'm here representing the provost's office and the Office of Global Programs. And I want to just take a minute to say how important this day is and how important this event is to the university. So I just felt as though I should be, yes, one of those administrative voices, but one of those voices that's saying how important it is that we have events like this and that we're actually dedicating an entire day to this, I think is very important. I think you all know what I mean when I say that when we s wake up each morning and we look at the newspaper or whatever tweets of the day there happens to be, we often feel despair about our state of international affairs and the position of the United States vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Um, so I feel as though it's really very much important for us to be saying that events like this are crucial to what an academic institution should be doing. We should be reminding ourselves of the role that we play as academic institutions in, in calling forth and calling for the importance of working together uh, for international understanding. And of course, that's what this day is all about. So I wanted to just mention that I think that Kiki speaking first and talking about appropriating the idea of African, Africa rising, taking this idea that is could be a somewhat negative term, appropriating that and turning it into something positive by adding pan, I want to emphasize that a bit myself in my remarks now by saying that's exactly what I think we all should be doing almost nationally, is taking some of our current situations that seem a bit filled with despair and saying there are ways that we can take them and turn them, appropriate them, make them positive. I think that this is a good example, this event, of taking that type of turning, making something positive, happening here on the UMass campus, taking something global and making it local. And that is what UMass Boston is best at. Taking something that's national, making it local, pulling it down to us and saying we can look forward, we can make it positive, we can find a way to work together on it. So when I look at that term, Pan-Africa Rising, I am thinking of that image of rising, that idea of energy, of working together, forward-looking, collaborative. The idea of Pan, that we are inclusive and in this all together. I want to take those ideas of energy and inclusion that we have in the title of today, pull that into the idea that UMass Boston is the place where we can make that happen, that we're seeing that energy here on our campus today. So I would like to say that one of the things that we are seeing is how we can take this and make it UMB. We can do that by making it multi-voiced. I'm very impressed when I look at this um, series of events for today. We have lectures, keynotes, roundtables, flash talks, a reception, food, and dance, as we just heard. Let's just think about that. It's multifaceted, but it's also multi-voiced. It's including experts, faculty, students, the community. It's not even just voice, it's music, it's food, it's multi-sensory. So I think that's how UMass Boston says, we can do this, we can make this positive, we can make it local. I also think we want to emphasize the idea that we are struggling with difficult ideas, but we are in it together to come up with new solutions and ways forward. So when I look at the program, we know that what we'll be talking about for the rest of the day, difficult issues like colonization, democracy, the economy, how can we incorporate youth into, into educational ways forward. These are tough topics, but again, together and with that pan added to this, there are ways forward. So I think that's a good example of how UMass Boston takes a difficult international topic and makes it ours. Finally, I do want to say we're really thrilled to be bringing in expert speakers like Pearl Robinson. That's another way that I think we make something UMass Boston is we say we want to know the best of the ideas. We want to be inspired by the ideas. So if we think a little bit about what this day represents, I think it represents taking issues that could be difficult, could be a bit 
full of despair, but making it UMass Boston by saying, let's emphasize the pan, let's emphasize the rising, let's make it multi-voiced, let's make it energetic, let's make it positive, let's pull together to think of solutions, and let's learn from experts. So I think that we can look forward to a really exciting day, and at the end we'll have a little bit of a reward with some dance at the end, at the end of the night. Um, so I, I hope we all feel as though the day captures that energy that we can look forward to, not just this year, but I've been told we will be doing this every year from here on out. Is that true, Kiki? Okay, so I'm, we're gonna hold you to that. So this is setting up, I think, a new UMass Boston way to work with Africa Day and to make it ours. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the afternoon together. Thank you very much, Associate Provost Cheryl Nixon from the Office of Global Programs. Uh, there are a few notable people I still want to uh, recognize in the audience. Uh, Dr. Gail D. Sabatino, the Vice Chancellor of Student Services. She's helped to sponsor our program today. Thank you very much. And Dr. D. Sabatino will be speaking this evening to open up our gala uh, dinner event tonight. So you can stick around and hear that. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, Dean Bill Cannon from the School of Global Studies and Development and Inclusion, right over here. Can, Dean Kiernan was there, was there a moment, a little bit ago, not any longer, okay. Um, and a couple of other people, uh, Dean David Turkla, College of Liberal Arts, also co-sponsored today, thank you very much. And um, unfortunately, the interim chancellor, Kathleen Newman, uh, sent her support uh, but she had a, an other event today and was unable to attend. But uh, she wanted us to enjoy ourselves today, and she looks forward to um, working with the Africa Scholar Forum in future events. Thank you. And one last um, reminder, we do have a donation box for a couple of charities that um, the Pan-African Scholars Forum and the Ghanaian Student Association, and just like the overall program as a whole, ha want to contribute to. So if you're feeling generous, feel free. The box is down below, but we'll move it around, so. Okay. Let me like to just call up Dr. Adozi one more time, please. Dr. Adozi is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Start our afternoon. In a moment. This is where we do the sing and dance. So I just want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. I'm, I'm missing all my pages uh, this, this afternoon. Okay, she, um, Dr. Pearl Robinson, is the, um, I say, penultimate Africanist dedicated to the study of Africa for over 40 years, and here's why. Um, actually, two of her students are on the faculty here at UMB, and I think that would be Dr. Darren Q, correct? <laughs> and uh, Dr. Jemadari Kamara, right? Um, were her students um, at Tufts. Um, Pearl Robinson is um, currently an associate professor in the political science department at Tufts University uh, with joint and or affiliate appointments um, at the Department of African American Studies as well as the Fletcher School of law and uh, international diplomacy. She earned her PhD from Columbia University in 1975 and has become a nationally renowned scholar for, um, of comparative politics, African affairs, and African American studies. Robinson spent uh, two years as a child, or as a young, um, a young woman, um, um, as a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger um, providing public health education in a rural Hausa town there. 
She has authored more than uh, 40 articles and book chapters on African and African-American politics, including she is the co-author of Stabilizing Nigeria, Sanctions, Incentives, and Support for Civil Society, and um, The Transformation of Resiliency in Africa. She is the past president of the um, African Studies Association, uh, which will be held uh, right here in Boston in November uh, this year, by the way. And she is a current member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Pearl has chaired the um, Joint Committee on African Studies um, at the SSRC. Uh, she has served on the boards of Oxfam America and Trans Africa. As a curriculum consultant, she has um, been a curriculum consultant for PBS, BBC, and the series The Africans, a Triple Heritage. And she was um, an advisor, and I believe you were on screen um, um, for the documentary Hopes on the Horizon, which is a two-hour documentary, a film about democratic movements in Africa during the 1990s. She is a past director of Tufts International Relations Program, and she has taught in Africa at Makerere University in Uganda and at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, two of Africa's best universities. In 2011, um, UC San Diego, uh, the research center in African and African American studies named Pearl Robinson recipient of its Salon Gabriel Distinguished Africanist Award. Her current projects include an intellectual biography of the 1950 Nobel Peace Laureate Ralph Bunch, which she'll talk about today. And really, she's actually um, doing a documentary on Mama Kyoto. Um, and this is about an Islam and female, female, it's about Islam, I'm sorry, and female empowerment in Nigeria. Okay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pearl Robinson. <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit of um, juggling here in that I have my text on paper that's not all printed out. So let me begin. The, I'm giving the title that I was asked to work with is Ralph Bunch and African Decolonization Implications for Postcolonial Africa. Uh, what I am doing is taking work that I'm doing on, on Ralph Bunch and I'm taking a particular uh, short moment of his life, the three years that he was working in military intelligence during World War II with the Office of Strategic Services, which was a precursor to the CIA. And what I want to show is how he was able in that job, which most people would say, what? You know, a spy or a, doing something, whatever that nefarious thing is the CIA do. But during this period, he was, I consider it one of his highest most successful uh, periods of Pan-African collaboration. And I'm taking this point, uh, Bunch's life, just to sort of show you that no matter where you are, if you go about it the right way, you can be a collaborative Pan-Africanist. I, I sent a, um, a timeline of Bunch's life because he did an awful lot of things, and a lot of times when I talk about him, most people, if they know anything about him, they know he won 1950 Nobel Prize for negotiating arms disagreements with Palestine and um, bet yeah, between Israel and four Arab countries. And they assume he's a Middle East 
specialists. When the State Department had its 50th anniversary for their Africa Bureau, I was invited to talk about Ralph Bunch, and my title was Ralph Bunch the Africanist. And I had all these pictures of him doing field work in Africa, the very first question at the end of my talk. And I was in the Ralph Bunch Library at the State Department. We thought he was a Middle East specialist. I said, well, yeah, that's why I'm writing this book. There's a Ralph Bunch people don't know about. <laughs> uh, so let me just begin. This is, I'm quoting from a letter to the school newspaper, The Hilltop at Howard University, written by a young student at the time named Ben in Azikui. That's how he signed it. Quote, and the he titled it Africa Speaks, and it was a letter to his fellow students at Howard University. Quote, for, for, for centuries, Africa has been painted in lurid pictures. Its culture has been covered with stupid machinations. Its conditions have been presented as sardonic, its future gloomy, and so we see the African from the Nordic's perspective. This is but Caucasian propaganda to keep the Negro American in ignorance and apparent disinterestedness on matters Afrique. So this appeared on the 7th of November, 1928. A letter penned by the young Ben Azikwe appeared in Howard University's campus newspaper, The Hilltop. Ben, a brilliant but dirt poor student from colonial West Africa, titled his message, Africa Speaks. He challenged the student body of the world's preeminent black university to move beyond the white man's depictions of Africa as a land held back by the relics of primitive barbarism. In pursuit of this goal, he sought to engage his fellow students in a pan-African dialogue. I continue to quote from his letter. It is highly essential that the African speak and open his mind to his Afro-American brother. We do not hold you guilty for your notions. We realize the effects of your history. We understand fully the situation which necessitated your psychologic and philosophic concept of the, Afri of the average African. Nevertheless, as representatives of a new Africa, we deem it wise to correct your notions and submit to you the thoughts of a modern and progressive Africa. This future Nigerian president was already thinking about a revolutionary advance for his homeland and considered it important to cultivate relationships rooted in knowledge and respect with Howard's black cosmopolitan student body. After all, they shared the same ethnic origin. Simply put, the young Azikwe was a Pan-Africanist who believed that establishing understanding and mutuality between the Afro-American and his international brothers might just be the best strategy for achieving the ultimate amelioration of the motherland. His political ideas were far from fully formed at the time. Yet he envisaged a role for this historically black college as a center for the diffusion of knowledge among Negroes the world over, to quote Zeke. A month earlier, the Hilltop carried two students about Ralph Bunch, two stories about Ralph Bunch. On October 18, 1928, Howard announced 13 new professors added to the faculty, including Ralph Bunch in political science department. Bunch didn't waste much time. Two weeks after he arrived, he had traveled to Cincinnati, Ohio to present a paper on Negro political laboratories before the National Municipal League. As a tagline, the story informs the student body that Prof. Bunch has just been elected head of the Department of Political Science on the Howard faculty. He is an honor graduate of the University of California and of Harvard, 
having been a fellow in both institutions. What the story doesn't tell us is that Prof. Bunch spent only one year at Harvard, where he received an MA in government, and turned down a fellowship to continue for his doctorate after being recruited for the Howard job. Moreover, his Harvard MA thesis was on Robert Filmer, a 17th century English political theorist who defended the divine rights of kings. Indeed, had Bunch not accepted the Howard job, he most likely would have continued in the field of European political theory. Instead, his intellectual interests took a sharp turn at Howard, where he focused on the dual freedom struggles of African Americans and Africans. Not only did he read Zeke's message to the Howard community, but he took it to heed. Bunch's 1934 dissertation, written for Harvard's Department of Government, offered a comparative analysis of French colonial administration in Dahomey, today's Benin, which was a colony under French rule, and Togoland, a League of, League of Nations mandate administered by France. In a stance that was unusual for its time, he set out to study Africa from the perspective of the Africans. And he framed a research design to accommodate hypothesis testing. For this groundbreaking work, Bunch won Harvard's Topin Prize for the year's best dissertation in the field of government. His was the first dissertation in Harvard's newly created subfield of the international relations with special attention to the government of dependencies. From 1929 to 1942, Ralph Bunch chaired Howard University's political science department. The university's location in the nation's capital, oh, I forgot about this. The university's location in the nation's capital rendered it a mecca for international visitors from colonial Africa, the Caribbean, and Asia. Students from these various regions connected campus intellectual and political life with the emerging tide of anti-colonial nationalism. White scholars with a serious interest in the black world were also part of the mix. And this cauldron, decolonization, became both an intellectual and a practical project. And as a young professor, Bunch had the extraordinary experience of being tutored by three of Africa's most brilliant student nationalists, Nande Azikiwe, Francis K. Nkrumah, and Johnston Kenyatta, future presidents of Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya, respectively. So Harvard was the degree, and Harvard gave the pedigree, but Howard made Bunch. There would be no Ralph Bunch if he had not taken that job at Howard. Bunch spent the formative years of his professional life as an academic who specialized in Africa. This remained the case as he moved from Howard to government work during World War II with the Office of Strategic Services and later to the State Department and then to the United Nations where he became director of the Trusteeship Council. My remarks focus on the relatively brief time he spent with the OSS. This was the only job Bunch ever had in which he worked full time only on African issues. So these are pictures which, uh, from his field work in Togo and in um, Dahomey. These are pictures from Togo. So what Bunch actually did because he was trained as a political scientist, he was reading documents, colonial documents, that were written by, uh, produced by the Europeans. And he was trying to figure out ways to actually get data on the perspective of Africans as they lived the colonial experience. So what he did is he collected pictures that the French made to show how they were bringing progress to Africans. And on some of these same themes, he went and he looked at, met real people and took pictures of their lives. 
So one of the early uh, things that he did in his dissertation was to actually use pictures as data. He, and then he did a two-year postdoc in anthropology, 1937-38. He began with a semester at uh, Northwestern, where he was supposed to be studying uh, with Herskovitz, but he really didn't. I've learned that while he took Herskovitz's course on the uh, African American, he took three courses at the University of Chicago where he developed some theories that he would usually work on. He then went to the London School of Economics and he took, he was with uh, Malinowski for a semester and that is where he met Kenyatta who was his Swahili teacher. Then he went to South Africa, he spent a semester with Isaac Shapira, did a lot of sort of field work things in South Africa, and then he went to Kenya, where he lived for two, two months with this chief, Koinangi. Uh, he uh, took a lot of pictures. He photographed and filmed a circumcision ceremony. He was present when the colonial uh, governor uh, called people together and told them that their land was being turned over, uh, made, was take, being taken away from them and turned into the white highlands of Kenya. He took all of these experiences into his work at the OSS. This is his job description for the work that he did at the OSS. Remember, the United States had been isolationist, so we needed for World War II uh, an intelligence service that would give us military information. And Bunch got the job actually because he knew more about contemporary Africa than any other person in the country. And so even though he's black, they figured they needed to hire him. This is from his file. He, his title was Senior Social Science Analyst, engaged by the Executive Office of the President, Service of the Coordinator of Information, to coordinate war information gathered from the War Department, the Navy Department, and other government agencies for use by the President of the United States and such officials as he may designate. This agency is actively engaged in the war effort. Full description of duties, research on Africa and other colonial areas, expert in all matters connected with the war effort so far as Africa is concerned. Uh, Dr. Bunch, was an almost unique, has an almost unique knowledge of Africa. It would be practically impossible to replace him. He is not only invaluable in research, but he is constantly acting in a consultant capacity for the State Department and for military intelligence in all matters pertaining to U.S. relations with Africa. Bunch's boss was William Donovan, who had been recruited by FDR to put together this uh, operation, this intelligence service, the OSS. He was recruited uh, because he had particular characteristics. In his youth, he was called, his nickname was Wild Bill. He was a Hoover Republican, Irish Catholic, millionaire, Wall Street lawyer, handpicked by Roosevelt to set up the government spy agency that would engage in espionage, sabotage, black propaganda, guerrilla warfare, and other subversive practices. Roosevelt was impressed by Donovan's passion, advocacy of U.S. involvement in Europe's conflict at the time with the general public, uh, when the general public remained isolationist. And FDR liked his organizational vision, his personal audacity, and his imagination. In these early years, if intelligence officers within the OSS held views about certain political actors counter to those of their superiors, they would at times make their views clear within the discrete limits of wartime intelligence memoranda. This is what Bunch did in the case of Zeke, whom the British considered a troublemaker. He was a nationalist. And so in looking through the archives of the OSS, you first find, he finds these descriptions of Zeke. He rewrote memoranda. He didn't just do that. He said that we actually have African students uh, here studying in the United States. I want to interview them. He put together a little research memo, memo uh, collected people. He brought them to the Hotel Teresa in Harlem, uh, got their backgrounds, 
wrote that up, wrote that up with, with Zeke, who was in West Africa at the time, had start, started some newspaper train, chains and was calling for, working for nationalism. And the memo said that there is a new Africa. And what he did was he took Zeke's newspaper article and wrote, wrote, fashioned that into an information memorandum uh, for the files in the OSS. He said that there are these people who've been trained at universities in the United States. They are intelligent. They are looking towards the future. These are the sorts of people who we need to work with us if we want to win the war. Um, and he used, he wrote, uh, in terms of Operation Torch, which Bunch was involved in the planning for that, that was the, an amphibious landing, the first amphibious landing in North Africa. Uh, and it was a very, very important strategic turning point for the war. So for that, what he said is he rewrote the memos on Africa. And he has his very first strategic memo he did on Africa begins by saying, Africa is of immense vital importance to the success of the war effort. All that language about backwards Africa, the dependent peoples, the this, that, and the other, none of that is in his memos. And he made it very clear that educated Africans consider as they look at the various Europeans, that they have options. That they may, and some of them actually see the Germans as an alternative to the British if they want to get from under the British and who are the Americans' allies and the French. And so he then, he used his role as a strategic planner to also make comments about how one needed to value the forward-looking Africans, and that one should not treat them with uh, racial disrespect. He even had a memo saying that educated Africans uh, are find it more offensive to be tra treated or mistreated because of race than Negro Americans. So you can't expect to treat them like you treat the people in the United States. And then he had another memo in which he said, the British don't understand why some Americans treat Negro soldiers so badly. So this can also hurt our war effort. So while he was there in that position, what he attempted to do was do some race politics. The other thing he did is Anson Phelps Stokes the Phelps Stokes Foundation decided that he wanted to call together a group of citizens who would write a report on what the United States should do vis-a-vis -vis Africa when the war ended. And he convened, he picked the people he thought should be on this committee, and he sent a letter to Ralph Bunch, who he thought the, address, the letter was addressed to Professor Bunch at Howard University. Anson Phelps Stokes always felt that whatever the Phelps Stokes Fund did in race relations, it had to have blacks and whites representative. And Du Bois was invited, a lot of missionaries. Um, Charles Johnson, president of Fisk, was invited. And Ralph Bunch was invited. To be black and invited, you had to have actually done something in Africa. But Bunch was already working for the OSS and his terms of service said he could not take on any outside job. So he told his boss, you know what they're doing will be important, and I've been invited. So maybe if I could be on this, this would also be helpful for my intelligence work. Then he, he wrote to Anson Phelps Stokes and said, why don't you tell my boss, uh, Conyers Reed, that it would be very helpful if I were on the committee. He got on the committee. The, initially, the committee was called the uh, committee, what was the name of this committee? It did not have the word war in it. 
So what they, they had a lot of people and they decided there would be a three-person drafting committee. Bunch got on the three-person drafting committee and he became the principal draft person. He put the title war in the name of the report. The Atlantic Council, the committee, um, the Committee on Africa, the War, and Peace Aims. Initially, it was just the Committee on Africa and Peace Aims. But the war was going on, and he wanted to try to use this report in terms of the strategic plan, planning he was doing in Africa uh, with the OSS. And at the same time, in, as part of the war effort in 1941, FDR and Churchill signed a document, an agreement, called the Atlantic Charter. The third clause of this affirmed the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live. It was a joint declaration uh, that was to define the aims of the war and the other allies joined on. Well, the people in the colonies started saying, ah, this Atlantic Charter, does it apply to the colonies? Uh, Churchill, who always knew what he wanted to say, said it does not apply to the colonies in the British Empire. And in fact, he said in Parliament uh, that he did not become the king's first minister to preside over the dissolution of the British Empire. What Bunch did in his role as drafts person, they took the charter, and in terms of the various provisions, if you look at it and you read it, every chapter is one of the principles in the Atlantic Charter. He named the report the Atlantic Charter and Africa from an American standpoint. And for each of the provisions, it tells you how it applies to Africa. So in this role, he was able to get this report that came out under the, the name of this very influential uh, group of high profile Americans that entered that debate that the West Africans uh, were having with the British uh, on their side. The report, and B Bunch's name does not appear in this report at all. Uh, in the black press, people condemned it saying it doesn't call for decolonization, didn't matter to Bunch. The report was sent to the British, people in the U United States and South Africa, all with the premature of this committee. And it became a very useful tool in the lobbying that went on in the United States. And just a few weeks before he died, FDR said that from the American standpoint, the principles of the Atlantic Charter were universal. So that is essentially what Ralph Bunch managed to do with this job that he got working for the early version of the CIA. It was a profoundly uh, masterful, in my view, uh, form of Pan-African work which he was able to do because he understood the goals, the objectives uh, of the young Africans and he shared them. And for me, as I sort of look for, looking forward to what are the implications for today, whatever it is you're doing, uh, if you consider yourself a person who is or wants to be involved in serious work of a pan of Pan-Africanism, you have to understand uh, your counterpart's goals. This can work on both sides of the waters if it works per correctly. It's never a matter of saying, I know what you want and let me help you get it. Uh, the Africa rising uh, scenario is something where somebody else is saying, I know what Africa needs and in my role as a, as a black person, I can help you get that that may not only not be what people want, but it may in fact be what's holding people back and undermining them. So. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Robinson, for that re very interesting talk about um, Ralph Munch and the OSS. Anyone interested in asking a question? We've got about 10 minutes. We can take three or four questions. Hi, Pearl. It's Darren Q. Oh, that's, yeah, you look Hi. like Darren. <laughs> Uh, thank you uh, for a, a great talk. I was wondering if you might say a little bit more about the relationships that Bunch built with the three African presidents and others um, after the period of the OSS. Um, did he continue to uh, sort of uh, use or engage these relationships in some way to, to foster Pan-Africanism? And did the relationships that, that they built with him and others in the US government have any sort of impact on, on Pan-Africanism after this period? Okay, so for my book, what I plan to do is I'm going to trace the evolution of these relationships over time. Uh, the one that soured the most, of course, is the one with Nkrumah. And it's most, it's most fascinating to me because Nkrumah had made a reputation for himself as a student. When Bunch convened the group of students uh, in, in Harlem, Nkrumah didn't come. He wanted to meet Nkrumah. So he called uh, Lincoln University. Nkrumah was all over the East Coast organizing and everything. He was an early Pan-Africanist. Uh, called and left messages. And then finally, Nkrumah got in touch with Bunch. And he said, OK, well, I'd like to meet you. And he went to Washington. And there's a really nice little letter that he wrote to Bunch after they had met saying, well, it's, I think that we can work well together. We seem to be on the same page, uh, but I'm not sure about the future. And I'm thinking, oh, he must have, uh, you know, he, and that, in the future it fell apart completely around Congo. Uh, so through the, one of the things that happens is that a lot of these relationships, you know, when people get big, the institution you're with makes a lot of difference. While Bunch was in the OSS, OSS, he was young enough to be able to not, not be in charge of what the institution was doing globally. And he was in the OSS at this particular point in time when Donovan's people, a lot of them were kind of freelancing uh, because of the kind of work they were doing. When he got to the UN, the relationship was quite, quite different, and Bunch, by 1960, was a very different man. He'd won the Nobel Prize, so a lot of people thought, you know, that was a mark of brilliance. Uh, he had risen in the uh, UN, but he had also been accused of being a communist. And from what I see in, in reading his papers, when he survived not being completely eliminated by uh, the accusation of communism. They dropped it after he spent a lot of time uh, trying to put together a document. He became very, very cautious about things he would do and very, very protective of the United Nations. So the Congo thing turned around and uh, they have a big confrontation in the UN. When somebody makes the feature length movie about Ralph Bunch, the scene of them arguing about, and Nkrumah comes and he says, the UN is messed up, Congo, you should turn running the uh, peacekeeping forces over to Africans. And Bunch would have none of it. Figured they, they didn't know what they were doing, or Lumumba specifically didn't know what he was doing. When people kind of point out the really nasty things that Bunch said about Lumumba, and he said some really nasty stuff, what I say is, you know, Bunch knew three Africans when they were young, and they were all very brilliant people. When he met Lumumba, he saw a man who was not very well educated and who was just sort of caught up in the moment of history. He couldn't relate to him, figured that he did not have the wisdom uh, to run the country. So you, you see a very different person. I think that the relationship with uh, Azikwe continued to be a good relationship. Don't know, I actually don't know what happened during the Nigerian Civil War. I'm gonna see if there's any evidence they, were, they got together. But one of the things that Zeke did when he was president of Nigeria, the uh, World Fair came to New York. And in the Amsterdam news, you know, blacks are upset because the whole people putting on the World Fair, they're saying they're not hiring any black people for any of these jobs. And Zeke says, 
Nigeria will not have a pavilion at the World's Fair if you don't hire black people. And it's rare that you see somebody who's an African president who will weigh in on a domestic thing. I think that the, the relationship with Kenyatta is the one I find most fascinating because Kenyatta was older than these other two whom he knew he met as undergraduates. And Kenyatta had spotted Bunch, I think, and decided he wanted a relationship with him. So they were both there at LSE, Malinowski's class, and Kenyatta says, you ought to let me teach you Swahili. He agrees. But Kenyatta would always take Bunch someplace for a lesson. He says, well, today we're going to go to the British Museum. And he's walking through, look at this, the artifacts of imperialism. And so when you read Bunch's notebooks from his Swahili lessons, what you're seeing is that Kenyatta is educating him about why empire has to go. But there is this other very touching uh, scene. Uh, one day, Bunch, is, Bunch had his family with him in London. His wife was a school teacher. She was taking some classes. So he was home with the two daughters babysitting, and Kenyatta comes to the house. And apparently Bunch, he was just focused on whatever the work was he was doing. And Kenyatta says, those girls are sick. And he says, what? And he looks at, yeah, I think we need to take them to the hospital. And the younger daughter was hospitalized for two weeks. And just sort of reading that in the notebook, first of all, you know, this African man comes into Bunch's house and he notices the children. And he takes that sort of care of them. After the fallout with Nkrumah, when Kenya gets into the UN, Based on correspondence, it looks like Bunch was going to try to have a relationship between Kenyatta and the UN. It's sort of like his African in the UN whom he could work with. But that never worked out. Thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, Dr. Ku, for that very good question. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. This brings us right up to the hour, 3 o'clock. We're going to take a brief 15-minute uh, break at this point, and then we're going to come back and have our, um, first, um, our, our first panel. But before that, let's thank Dr. Uh, excuse me. Let, let, let's thank Dr. Robinson for her talk on Ralph Bunch, African Decolonization, the Implications for Post-Colonial Africa Today.